Revelation 4 and verse 11. Hallelujah. Let's read together like a mass choir. One to God. Thou, Thou art worthy, O Lord, Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. One more time. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things and, and for, for thy pleasure, pleasure they, they are and, and were created. created. Please be seated in the presence of the living God. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were are created. Now, my topic today is the only purpose for living. The only purpose for living. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, people live for various purposes or for various things. Number one, some people live for money. Some people live for money. First Timothy 6 and verse 10. First Timothy 6 and verse 10. The Bible says, For the love of money is a source of all kinds of evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered away from the faith and have broken their hearts with many sorrows. To some people, the prime reason for their living is to make money. Their policy is, whatever it takes, I must get money. It doesn't matter whether I break the rules, doesn't matter whether I sin, whatever it takes, I must get the money. To them, it doesn't matter what you do as far as you get the money. According to them, the end justifies the means. As long as I get rich, as long as I get money, to them the purpose of life is to get money. Their determination has caused them to abandon the path of the fear of God completely in their quest for wealth. They are quest to get rich. They get involved in every wrong business without even minding the opinion of God and they later end up in multiple court cases, sleepless nights because their purpose of life is to get money. They may agree to get an affair with a married man as long as it will bring financial benefits to them and by so doing, they multiply curses. They work daily, including Sundays. No time for God. No time for prayer. No time for fellowship. They'll agree to compromise with the boss sexually for the purpose of promotion. The problem with that is that when such kind of promotion comes into somebody's life, it comes accompanied with sorrow. For the Bible says in Proverbs 10 and verse 22, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he earns no sorrow. Only the blessing of God does not come with sorrow. Any other form of help, if it is not coming from God, it has an accompaniment called a sorrow. This kind of people whose their primary purpose is making money because money is their focus of living, they try all they can to accumulate as much. And by so doing, they become stingy. Stingy. They will not give God anything. They will not give anybody anything. They are trying to hold on to every coin. Their purpose is to have money and accumulate a lot of it. What they don't understand is what the scripture says in Proverbs 28 and verse 22. Proverbs 28 and verse 22. A stingy man hastens after wealth and does not know that poverty will come upon him. 
They also don't understand what the Bible says in Proverbs 11 verse 25. Proverbs 11 verse 25. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. But because their purpose is to get money and to get rich, they have become stingy. And therefore, they are becoming poor and needy every single day. They don't understand that give us get and take us loose. There can never be greatness without generosity. They don't understand that you may make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. That's the reality of those who people who live for money. To them, the purpose of life is making money. Brothers and sisters, I want to let you know that is not the purpose of life. Are you still here? If you're here, say amen. Amen. There is a second category of people, those who live for pleasure. They live for pleasure. To them, life is for fun. A lot of sleep, one party after another, drinking alcohol or wine here and there, always on phone, spending plenty of time for socialization, Endless time watching TV programs and movies. Severally organizing trips out of town with their fun loving friends in order to go and engage in all manner of ungodly fun. Once in a while, they'll attend a Sunday service and I hope they came today. They have no time for midweek services and other fellowships. Serving in a department of ministry is a no, no. They have no time to join discipleship class in order to be grounded in the word of God because their time is consumed in fun and fantasies. Fun and fantasies. To them, life is about fun and fun and more fun. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6, the Bible says, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. She that lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. To them whose purpose of living is fun and pleasure, their lives are so empty and devoid of purpose and value. Though they are still alive, they have literally no difference with a dead person according to the scriptures. They have literally no difference with a dead person because their lies, the purpose of life is pleasure and fun. That's the reality of those who live for pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that is not the purpose of life. The purpose of life is not pleasure. The purpose of life is not having fun. Can I hear somebody say amen? Amen. Are you still here? Number three. Number three categories of people. And they are those who live for the world. They live for the world. In 1 John 2 and verse 15. 1 John 2 and verse 15. The Bible says. Do not love the world. Or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world. The love of the father. Is not in him. There are those people who live for the world. It means the world dictates their lives. Their dressing is worldly. So they wear all manner of seductive dressing. Their language is worldly. They are full of all manner of vulgar languages and carnal speakings. They engage in all manner of dirty jokes. They follow the world threats of their generation. All manner of tattoos all over their bodies. Tattoo of a serpent, a lizard, and all wild animals combined. <laughs> Others are willing to even go for plastic surgeries. Others, they read all manner of worldly novels and magazines. Others 
listen to all manner of worldly music. They engage in all manner of worldly discussions. Instead of listening to sermons and anointed music, anointed preachers and teachers of the word of God, and anointed music to cause their spirit to connect with God, they listen to all manner of worldly radio programs. And they enjoy following dirty, useless, worldly topics considered to be hot, hot in the morning. You know, on the radio. These people have no time for God. The world is running their lives. They can't start for God because of what their worldly friends will say. The world is their dictator. The world is their God. Brothers and sisters, James chapter 4 and verse 4. James chapter 4 and verse 4. The Bible says, and and Adotarasis, all genders are addressed in that scripture. Adotaras and Adotarasis. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. By loving the world, these people have become enemies of God. And that's the reality of those who live for the world. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, that is not the purpose of life, living for the world. I want to give you the fourth category if you say a good amen. Amen. Say a better amen. Amen. The fourth category of people, today is a short sermon, then we pray. They are those who live for themselves. They live for themselves. And the story of the rich fool is the story of a man who perfected the art of living for himself. In Luke 12, verse 16 to 20. Luke 12, verse 16 to 20. The Bible says, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, the crowd of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my clubs? So he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. Nothing wrong with that. And I will say to my soul, Look at that. So, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat. Drink. And be merry. Verse 20. God had the conversation of his heart. And he decided to appear to him. And give him some breaking news. But God said to him. Fool. This night. Your soul will be required of you. Then whose those things which you have provided for. In other words, who is going to eat all those things you've worked so hard to accumulate? My focus is verse 19. And I will say to my soul, so you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. In that scripture, there is no space for God. The man is full of himself. No space for God. He can't even say, I'll take a piece of it, just a little, and give to Gosek. <laughs> yeah. So, so they can also go to Kitui and win souls. There is no space for God. He has accumulated. He lives for himself. And God said, that kind of attitude is not the reason why I created you and he frustrated the man. Those who live for themselves, what they do is determined by what they want, not what God wants. They fully run their own lives. They are their own personal government. God's opinion is not welcome regarding the affairs of their lives. Are you still here? These kind of people, they have 
everything figured out. They say things like, I want a tall, dark and handsome man, fully loaded with money. I'll marry the brother by the time I'm 28. Then I, I'm going to go to school and do this course and do this course. I want to work for this number of days, invest here and there, get married by this time, give birth to a boy by this time, and then to a girl by this time. They have their lives figured out. They don't feel the need to seek the will of God about anything. To them, you figure out life and you make things happen. They are their own God. But I want to ask you a question. What if your plans contradicts with God's plans for your life? What if you want to be a lawyer and God wants you to be a doctor? What if you want to live in Nakuru and God wants to live in Nyeri? What if you are pursuing Canada and the idea of God is India? <laughs> I'm just asking a question. <laughs> These people boast of having self-confidence other than putting their confidence in God. They talk of self-love. And our generation is getting obsessed with self-love other than talking of loving God. They talk of self-trust instead of putting their trust in God. Brothers and sisters, Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 8. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 8. Trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on him to guide you and he will lead you in every decision you make. Verse 6, become intimate with him in whatever you do and he will lead you wherever you go. Can I hear somebody say amen? Amen. God has not called you to live for yourself. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 to 6. The Bible says, this is what the Lord says. Cast are those who put their trust in mere humans. Who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. Hear me? When the Bible says, putting your confidence, your trust in mere humans, you are also a mere humans. When you trust yourself, you are trusting on mere humans. Because you too are a mere human. Don't just consider beyond you or exempt, accept you. No. Include yourself as a mere human. When you trust yourself, you are putting your trust in mere humans and you are relying on human strength. Relying on your academics. Relying on your skill. Many people have put their trust on their skills. That's why their destinies are being killed. Are you still here? The Bible says, Aha, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. Verse 6, they are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an inhabited salty land. This is the lot of people who put their confidence in themselves. And those people who live for themselves. Somebody say, that is not my portion in the name of Jesus Christ. That is not my portion in the name of Jesus Christ. I decree upon everybody hearing me, that shall never be your portion in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The curse in Jeremiah 17 shall never become your portion in the name of Jesus. Amen. Say a big amen. Amen. I want to go to number five. And this is the category God wants you and I to be in. There are those who live for God. Those who live for God. My topic was the only purpose of living. The only, not one of the purposes, the only purpose of living. Those who live for God. Revelation 4 and verse 11. Revelation 4 and verse 11 is the first scripture we read 
as we began the sermon. The Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. As you can see, I'm very systematic today. I want everybody to hear every word that's my purpose of preaching. So, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, God created you and I for his pleasure. Somebody say pleasure. Pleasure. Let me hear somebody say pleasure. Pleasure. What does it mean when God says, for thy pleasure I created you? He's saying, I created you to fulfill my desires. I created you for your life to bring me delight. I created you for one reason, to serve my purpose. Not your purpose. Not to serve yourself. Not to make yourself comfortable. To serve my purpose for my pleasure. When I created you, I wanted something that would bring me pleasure. Not bring itself pleasure. Am I communicating? The purpose of life is to live for God. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 15. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 15. The Bible says, And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So God sent his son to die for us so we can live for him. Am I communicating today? If I'm communicating, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to give you a true story. You know, one day there was a particular boss and he had a bodyguard. So, one day, as they walked along, there was a criminal who targeted to kill the boss. Are you still here? If you're here, wave your hands and shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. The criminal decided, I'm going to kill the boss. So, what happened is, that the bodyguard spotted the criminal before the boss could see the criminal. So what he did, he stepped in front of the boss and shielded the boss with his body. And the bullet blew off the bodyguard. The moment the bodyguard died, when the boss looked at the bodyguard, and knew what had happened. From that day he decided. Every bill of this bodyguard. For his family. I will take it up. His responsibilities of raising his children. Paying the school fees. It's on me. Why did he decide that? Because he understood. The bodyguard died my death. Now I'm going to live his life. He didn't die his death. He died my death. So his responsibility, I'm going to prolong his life by taking over his responsibilities. I, am I communicating today? Now I want you to understand that is what happened to Jesus Christ. That is exactly what happened to Jesus Christ. Now it was you. The bullet of death was targeting but Jesus stood in front of you and shielded you. That's why he died like this. He was shielding you from a bullet. The idea was, I had a vision. Now that I have died for you, pick up my vision and continue with it. I have died your death. So now pick up my vision and my mission and continue with it. So Jesus made our battle his battle so we can make his mission our mission. He made our burden of sin his burden so that we can make his burden of souls our burden. He took our death so that we can take both his life and his assignments as our own. So the boss, hear me, the boss picked over the assignment and even the responsibility of taking care, 
you're building the house for the wife of the, of the, of the bodyguard, taking care of the children, because he understood it is me who was supposed to die. Now that he died, so that I can leave, I'm going also to take over his responsibilities. Am I communicating? When Jesus died, he left us his wife. His wife is the church. And he left us his children. His children are souls. <laughs> so what he wants us to do is for us to take over the responsibilities of his wife, his church, and his children and begin to take care of that because he took the bullet for us. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. But it even gets better because actually in this scenario, it is the boss who took the bullet for the bodyguard. Because Jesus is our boss. So let me paint a scenario. Imagine you're a bodyguard of somebody who lives in Kereshua or Karen. Let's say Karen, isn't it? One big massive house. And you are their bodyguard. And then somebody wants to shoot you. Am I communicating? You're the bodyguard. Eh? Okay? You're the bodyguard. You live in somewhere in Tidia of Gedorai. Are we together so far? I'm not talk back to me, somebody. Yeah? You're the bodyguard. The boss has shielded you. He has died. And now you take the same concept that now I'm taking over his vision. I'll live his life because he died my death. You know what that means? It means the death of your boss is your promotion. Because all of a sudden, you move to Karen. Ah, talk back to me, somebody. Talk back to me, somebody. All of a sudden, you move to Karen. So what am I trying to say? The death of Jesus, when we pick up his responsibility, is for our promotion. He snatches our small, insignificant life and then gives us meaning for life. Meaning for life. And all the resources of heaven you know, the Holy Spirit, the empowerment of God begins to become our resources because we've taken over his vision. The vision of his church. The vision of mass evangelization. The vision of saving the world from insignificant bodyguard assignment to now a big vision of my boss because he died in my place so I can step in his place and continue with his assignment. So he moves us from being village champions into carrying the burden for the world. So the death of our boss is the upgrade of the bodyguard. Hear me? God is calling our lives by giving us the vision of soul winning. The vision of changing the world is an upgrade. <laughs> He's trying to pull us from insignificant life and give meaning to our money, give meaning to our life, give meaning to our breathing. Say amen, somebody. Amen. What is the vision and the responsibilities of our boss? Luke 19, verse 10. Luke 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If I shout, it's because I'm excited. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save which was lost. Am I communicating today? If I'm communicating, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. As I come to the close, look at Philippians 1 and verse 21. That should be the confession of everyone. I'm talking about the only purpose of life. The only purpose of life. Not one of the purposes of life. The only purpose of life. Look at the confessions of Apostle Paul. Let's read together one to go. For, for me, me living, living means, means living, living for, for Christ, Christ and dying, dying is even, even better. better. For me, living means living for Christ. Living means living for Christ. For me, if, I, if I'm going to breathe, the only reason for my breathing is Christ. Give me good word. Bible. GW. Translation. Do you have it? Let's read together. Christ means everything to me in this life. Christ means everything to me in this life. And when I die, I'll have even more. Look at that. Friends, 
Life is not worth living if, it, if it's not lived for Christ. Life is not worth living if it's not lived for Christ. Life lived for anything else other than Christ is a waste. Let me ask you a question. I know you live for Christ and I know you love God. But let me ask a rhetoric question to some of you. To some of you it's rhetoric. To some of you it's a good sobering question. If you don't live for Christ, what else are you going to do with your life? Let me ask you another question. If your eyes are not used for seeing, what else are you going to use your eyes for? <laughs> because you only created it for him, to serve him. So that's the only purpose why you are alive. If you don't do that purpose, what other purpose are you going to do with your life? Where will you take your life? To me, living for Christ is like using your eyes to see. There's no other purpose to eyes except to see. You can't say eyes are for deco. No, let's say no. Let's be serious. No, no, no matter no matter how cute your eyes are, <laughs> that's just a, an addition to it. They are not for deco. Eyes are for seeing. So if you don't use your eyes for seeing. What other purpose will you use your eyes for? If you don't use your life to serve Christ, what are, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? <laughs> Living for Christ is not just the best way to live. It is the only purpose for living. What does it mean to live for God or to live for Christ? It is making God the most important reason for living. Living for Christ or living for God, it is living your life primarily to please God and not to please man. You are living primarily for God's approval, not for man's approval. It means making God your priority in how you spend your time. You see, time is the SU unit. The, the, the standard unit that's used to measure your life. That's why your life is called lifetime. Lifetime. Because time is the standard, the SU unit that is used to measure your life. Living for God is giving God the glory in the management of your resources. In other words, giving your resources to advance God's agenda which is the salvation of souls. Giving, spending your resources boldly, aggressively, for the single most reason we are alive, to spread God's agenda. That's what living for God is. This week I had something that was a blessing. Are, they, the, are you still here? The children of Israel when they were coming from Egypt, they stripped the Egyptians. You are aware of that? Okay? Gold and silver and many precious things. When they got to the wilderness, there were two kinds of giving that represents the givings of the people and the givings of the church. The first giving they gave to Aaron to make a golden calf. And the second giving they gave to Moses to build God an ark or a tabernacle. Then I learned something that there are people who are using their money to build idols. All their money is used to build their own houses, build their whatever, build those are idols. That's, that's what they, that's primarily, that's the purpose of money. To build calves, multiply calves. And, and, and the preacher said something humorously. He said, I wish they were even building a cow, a calf. <laughs> I mean, if you're worshipping, if you're worshipping an animal, worship the adult one. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Not the child animal. <laughs> Am I communicating? Yeah. So, but the others 
that have decided to use their resources to build an ark for God. To change eternity. To transform the world for Jesus. Because I promise you, all these things we are building, we are actually preparing stable for fire. These are materials for fire. The entire earth will go on frames. So we are actually just preparing some things that will make the fire burn faster. Can I hear somebody say hallelujah? We can do all that. But we must remember that's not the primary reason to get rich. If that becomes the primary reason, what a waste of resources. <laughs> if our resources is for that, what a waste of energy. What a waste of energy to go to work just to accumulate money, to, to multiply calves everywhere and idols. Then after that, we exit. And when we go to eternity and we, we are confronted with bankruptcy in the banks of heaven. Bankruptcy in the banks of heaven. What a waste of energy and resources. What a waste of life. Am I communicating today? Tell somebody, use your resources. Use your resources. To build God's house. To build God's house. Use your resources. Use your resources. To take care. Take care. Of the wife of your boss. The wife of your boss. Tell them he died. He died. So you can live for him. So you can live for him. Am I communicating today? Living for God is existing as a visible and ashamed representative of God to your world. Visible and ashamed representative of God to your world. And this is the scenario where your life reminds people about God. You don't even have to preach. Your life Reminds people about. If, in case they are forgotten. When they see you. They remember God. In case they are ignoring God. When they see you in your company. They remember God. In case they are trying to behave as if God does not exist. Your presence is a constant reminder. God is in charge. And he exists. And is worthy of all the praise. <laughs> Am I communicating? And, and I use the word visible. Unashamed representative. Hmm. I'm talking about even to people who have never read the Bible. Your daily life becomes walking Micah. Walking Habakkuk. <laughs> you are a breathing you are a breathing Genesis. Talk back to me somebody. <laughs> yeah, You are a breathing walking Leviticus. I'm not communicating today. <laughs> Yeah, don't read the Bible if you're not interested. But if I'm in that company, I am a walking Bible because the principles of the Bibles are laid bare through my daily life. So you like it or not, Bible, Bible is walking. You don't want to read Bible written, you read Bible walking. You don't want Bible written, you read Bible words. That's why God has placed you where you are. So that those who don't like the Bible and who can never read the Bible can see the Bible walking. That's the purpose of life. That's all. That's the purpose of life. That's all. We summarize. That's the purpose of life. That's all. Any other extras is a waste of life. As you can see, I'm very passionate about it. Somebody say hallelujah. Look at Paul. Paul confession. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 2. The Bible says, You are our epistle written in our hearts. Known and read by all men. Men are letters. Men are letters. Yeah. When people are gossiping, when you appear, your appearance should rebuke their gossip. Not motivate their gossip. Uh, talk back to me, somebody. Your appearance should not add fire to the gossip. It should add the gossip. It's a gossip extinguisher. <laughs> yeah. If people are talking immoral stuff, when you appear, the immorality must be rebuked without you saying a word. We are walking epistles. Yeah, it's the pastor is coming. Keep quiet. That's, that's how they should be saying, pastor is coming. Keep quiet. You can't say that when pastor is around. People should watch their tongue when you're around. 
Not because you said what you are talking. You are a rebuke. You are a walking rebuke. Some people when they are there is when even story may work. Mbaka wana contribute. Ime shika. <laughs> but we are walking epistles. Can I hear somebody say hallelujah? hallelujah. You like it or not where Pastor Dan goes, you have to behave. Because I make it public. I don't make public, I'm just a believer. I tell everybody I'm a pastor. Include those who don't like pastors. So that at least you can include me in the category of those who don't like. <laughs> yeah, because you don't like pastors, I want you to know I'm a pastor so that you can include me in that category. I want to be in that category. That being hated is a blessing to me. I don't want to miss out on my blessing. <laughs> I want you to know I'm a pastor. That's why I am. I'm a pastor. And I like it. Walking a pistol. My generation is ignoring reading the Bible. But that was never meant to be a problem. If believers can be walking epistles, Bibles will be everywhere. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell somebody, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm sitting next to Habakkuk. I don't know. I'm, I'm sitting next to. I'm sitting next to. You're sitting next to Revelation. Revelation. You, you, you're sitting next to who? Eh? Are they? James. You're sitting next to, there's a James there. There's a James there. There's an Esther somewhere. Hallelujah. Malachi. There's a Malachi. Where's Malachi? It's your wife. <laughs> Malachi is seated over there. Hallelujah. There's somebody, you're a walking epistle. Walking epistle. You're a letter to be read by man. Letter to be read by man. Do you know, by the way, you're supposed to be so obvious, you don't introduce yourself as saved. When you're just quiet, somebody asks, are you a pastor? It's supposed to be so obvious in your quietness. Yeah. You know, Bible doesn't talk. But if you place a Bible there, somebody says, no, that's a Bible. Uh, talk back to me, somebody. Bible does not talk, but just place a Bible on the table. Everybody says, is that a Bible? That's how it's supposed to be. You don't even have to talk. Just the way you dress, the way you carry yourself. Are you a pastor, sir? Are you a pastor? Are you a deacon? Are you a bishop? Are you, are you, are you? <laughs> Sister, the way you are, it's like you're born again. Yeah, it should be obvious without your words. Because Bible does not talk, but Bible is obvious. Bible does not talk, but Bible is obvious. But if you're looking like them, walking like them, somebody looks and says, ah. They even try to hit on you because anyway, everything is indicating you should be heated on. <laughs> it's like everything is saying, hit me. <laughs> ah. Yeah. everything, the dressing, the talk the way you carry, everything is communicating the difference of what the Bible stands for somebody say that's not my portion that's not my portion, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about you look God, you smell God you walk God, you talk God, you model God that is the life living for God, can I hear somebody say amen, amen in a life that is not lived for God is considered a wasted life. And until you live for God, you can never end with God. Hear me? Until you live for God, you can never end with God. I'll tell you why we have a lot of backsliding. Because many people are not living for God. And because they have not, they don't have the culture of living for God. Over time, you drop. You drop. This thing does not work if you don't live for him. You drop. Those who don't live for God, I promise you, give them five years. They will not end with God. Give them 50 years. Give them 15 years. Give them 20 years. Until you live for God, you can never end with God. Mark 8 and verse 38. Very interesting scripture. Mark 8, 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man, also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. Those who are ashamed to live for God on earth, God will be ashamed to live with them in heaven. <laughs> Until you live for God, you can never end with God. 
Very interesting scripture. That's why I don't want to be ashamed. I want to go out and win souls. I don't want to be ashamed for God. I want to, him to know I, I was never ashamed of you. Please don't be ashamed in your holy ab abode. When I show up, receive me. Because on earth, I wasn't ashamed of you. It's not coming to church that will take you to heaven. Rather, it is boldly and apologetically living for God. Listen to what David Livingstone, a man that has a very interesting story said. He said he, had, he has a very interesting story of abandonment, abandoning his own life for the sake of the gospel. He said, I give him, God, I give him everything. What a pity. <laughs> what a pity I have so little to give. What a pity. It's like I have only one lifetime. What a pity that my lifetime is too minute. Sometimes I feel like that. My lifetime is too minute to really impact God and impact the world. But I only have that one. So I'm going to try to give everything there is about it. Though I know it's too minute, too literal, too literal, one life, too literal, one lifetime. He says, what a pity that I have too literal to give my master. William Booth said something, and I copied this, founder of Salvation Army, at age 15, at age 15, he said, God shall have all the arrays of William Booth. All the arrays of God shall have all the arrays of William Booth. I'm trying to copy that saying in my own personal life. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. That is what it means to live for God. Wave your hands and shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wave, wave, wave again and shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. So question, what is the connection of living for God and accessing healing and deliverance? Say pastor, I thought this healing and deliverance service. What is the connection between, I thought you are going to teach about 17 things to get into your healing, 18 things into deliverance. No, uh, it, it's, it's connected. This is the main thing. Listen to this. What is the connection of living for God and accessing healing and deliverance? Listen. Those who live for God are highly helped and highly defended by God. Those who live for God. <clears throat> the shortcut of accessing your healing and your deliverance is living for God. Exodus 23, 25 to 26. Exodus 23, 25 to 26. Read. So you shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread and your water. You shall serve the Lord your God. In other words, your life will be for the service of God. Not for your own service. Not to serve yourself. Not to serve your pocket. But your life will be spent every drop of your blood. Every minute of your heartbeat will be spent to serve God and to serve his purposes. What will happen after that? And I will take away sickness from the midst of you. He will bless your bread and your water provision. Continue. And, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. I will take away sickness from the midst of you. What is that healing? Is it not healing? Go to verse 26. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. That is healing and deliverance combined. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will give you long life. I'll give you long life because I want my kingdom to benefit from your service. So I want you to stay around. One of our pastors had a brother and the brother was very sick in the hospital. Very, very sick. And he went to prayer and he was interceding. Say, Lord, heal my brother. And the Holy Spirit asked him, I heal him so that he can do what for me. And the brother was known for wickedness. <laughs> he was a wicked man practicing witchcraft properly. God asked him, it's okay. You want me to heal him so that he can multiply wickedness on earth. That's how the prayer ended. In three days, he rested. The intercession <laughs> was, was intercepted. <laughs> the intercession was intercepted. You want me to heal him so that he can do what? So that he can multiply wickedness and kill more people. That's why you want me to heal him? 
That's how the prayer ended. Three days or so, the brother passed on. I shall fulfill the number of your days. Men who live for God are not easily dead, killed. You can't just kill a man that lives for God. Yeah, you can, It's not very easy. You may make attempts and you go to great rank, but it's not that easy. It's not that easy, I'm telling you. If the man is genuinely living for God. Wow. Matthew 6 and verse 33. The final scripture. Is anybody listening to me today? But then if you, if you come to this church over time, you discover it's, it's, that's like my main message anyway. That's like my main message. What I'm preaching is like my main message. That's like what I was born to preach. Read. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Make God and his kingdom your focus of living. And what others are killing to get will be placed into your hands by God without unnecessary sweat. <laughs> what men are killing to get will be placed into your hands by God without unnecessary sweat. Just a necessary one. The working hard and whatever, but not unnecessary sweat. You take away unnecessary labor because the kingdom of God and his establishment is your priority. Brothers and sisters, it remains. It remains. Those who live for God, they are massively helped by God. They are massively assisted by God. Can I hear somebody say amen? Amen. And I see somebody getting the assistance of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I see God fighting your battles without even your knowledge in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I see God frustrating your enemies without even consulting you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because you live for God. God will not hesitate to invest into your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. I receive so many news everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. If you are Pastor Shalit, she will tell you, lack of peace is not anything that has ever entered my heart once. Yeah. Yeah. You see, I live for God. And if I live for God, I have handed over all my battles to him. <laughs> That's my policy. I live for him every day. So all my battles you can handle. So I can handle yours. And it does well. It's a beautiful baguette. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Are you blessed? If you're blessed with your hands, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Some of you, you have not joined any department. Join. It's time to join. It's time to join. Somebody who died for you properly. Why do you want to serve him improperly? <laughs> Somebody who died for you with a passion. Why do you want to serve him without passion? He died for you with the passion. <laughs> he didn't die for you halfway. Why do you want to serve him halfway? He gave his entire life. Why do you want to give him your half life? It's time for you to arise. Don't just come to church, listen and go. It's still okay to do that. But somebody who gave his all, why do you want to give him your half? What a terrible bargain. What a terrible business transaction. <laughs> I put all my money. You, you put three coins. <laughs> yeah. I love you as my wife with all of my life. You, you want to love me with only your leg. <laughs> what a terrible transaction. <laughs> it's time for you to give your all. Whatever breaks you put before. To serving God. It's time to take away the breaks. Because years are passing. And there is no other purpose to life. And maybe the day you decide to serve God. You'll have now few years left. Yeah. Look at me now. I'm 42. Slowly, slowly 50. Slowly, slowly 60. And I don't want to waste my life. Oh. Yeah. I want to give my all Ali. So he can have a lot. By the time I exit. If you're waiting for you to be 50, to be 55, to be 60, for you to make a decision, why do you want to give your all, just a little, few, whatever? God will have so little. And yet the other time you never made a decision, it was wasted because there is no other purpose for life. Stand up on your feet, I'm done.